If you're as neurotic as I am, you've probably pondered at least once. Can I found a sovereign nation and declare myself head of state, thereby exempting myself from the duties and responsibilities demanded of me by my current government, such as paying taxes? Well, actually, you can, but as you can imagine, there's some work involved. Firstly, international law specifies some minimum requirements for you to be eligible, one of which is that you must have a defined territory. Sadly, this is where our plan falls apart, at the very first hurdle, like most of my other plans. Chances are you were thinking your sovereign nation would exist entirely on your property. After all, you bought the land, it's yours. You can turn it into a sovereign nation if you want to. Well, your government would probably disagree, and if you intend to tell them that your land is no longer part of their territory, well, good luck. If you're lucky enough to live in a part of the world where the government will simply ignore this, I wouldn't push your luck. They won't care about your kingdom or empire or whatever until you and your citizens actually start living under your own law and ignore theirs. This will get you in trouble. If you decide to forcibly assert your independence and resist their law enforcement, expect to be referred to not as the head of state, but as the head of a cult. Enjoy that while it lasts. So to summarise, you've basically got two choices for your dreams of statehood. Have them completely ignored in every official capacity, or go down in a bloody blaze of glory in resistance to the government. Both these options have been tried and tested by many before us, and today we'll be taking a look at one such story. What happened to the self-declared Emperor of the United States? Joshua Norton was born in 1818 in England. Two years after his birth, he and his family moved to South Africa. As merchants, they enjoyed a degree of wealth, and when Joshua left for the United States in 1849, he brought with him a personal fortune. Arriving in San Francisco, California, Joshua Norton quickly got involved in real estate and commodities trading, multiplying his wealth. He became one of San Francisco's more prosperous and respected citizens, enjoying the high life as a member of exclusive clubs and committees, rubbing elbows with the upper class at expensive parties and fancy establishments. As an eternal begrudger, it sounds to me like this guy needed to be taken down a peg or two. Unfortunately for Norton, the divine peg movers erroneously dropped the peg to the floor where it fell in dog shit and no one wanted to pick it back up again. For you see, in 1852, a famine in China created a shortage of rice in San Francisco, driving the prices up nearly tenfold. Seeing an opportunity and thinking the price of rice is nice, Norton located a ship returning from Peru with rice and bought the entire shipment. It was a license to print money, until very shortly after, when a bunch of ships arrived also carrying rice and of better quality. With the supply restored, the prices plummeted, leaving Norton in a spot of bother. He tried to void his rice contract, stating the quality was not up to snuff, and this led to a lengthy legal battle. After three years, the courts ruled against Norton, and he was financially ruined. He was soon living in a boarding house. Norton grew disillusioned with the state and the law, which means he's back in my good books. Now a downtrodden outcast with nothing to his name but a rebellious attitude towards the man, Norton decided there was only one course of action. He had to take matters into his own hands. In 1859, he had a letter published in a San Francisco newspaper that read, at the peremptory request and desire of a large majority of the citizens of these United States, I, Joshua Norton, formerly of Algoa Bay, Cape of Good Hope, and now for the last nine years and ten months past of San Francisco, California, declare and proclaim myself Emperor of these United States, and in virtue of the authority thereby in me vested, do hereby order and direct the representatives of the different states of the Union to assemble in Musical Hall of this city on the first day of February next, then and there to make such alterations in the existing laws of the Union as may ameliorate the evils under which the country is labouring, and thereby cause confidence to exist, both at home and abroad, in our stability and in Integrity. Norton I, Emperor of the United States. For the next 20 years, Norton acted as Emperor, although in reality he was a pauper. Whether it was all in good humour or his fall from the top to the bottom had driven him mad is not quite known, but most seem to agree he was an eccentric character. 
To the newspapers, he issued many decrees on matters of state, abolishing Congress, dissolving the two-party system. He even called for the construction of a suspension bridge from Oakland to San Francisco in 1872. In this, he was somewhat of a visionary, as the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge began construction in 1933. Coincidence? Well, yes, actually, the government totally ignored Emperor Norton, but despite his increasing frustration at this, other than commanding the army to arrest politicians and further decrees, he didn't take it any further than that and lived under the law like most other citizens. So how did the other citizens view him? He was actually well liked, he had been a respected member of society beforehand and was always described as friendly and kind. Many of his decrees had the well-being of everyday citizens in mind, focusing on things like taxes and the upkeep of the streets, and he spent his days wandering around the city listening to people's problems, attending public lectures and debates and even state legislature proceedings, ensuring he was well versed in the troubles of his city. Because of this, many humoured him in his stylings as emperor. He lived off people's donations, that he called tax. He issued his own imperial money, and some businesses even accepted this, even though it was completely worthless. As an aside, some of these notes survive to today, and they're worth quite a lot of money now. A nearby army base donated old uniforms for his regal outfit, and when the people of San Francisco noted his appearance was starting to look shabby, the city's government bought him new uniforms. In a local directory, his occupation was even listed as emperor, although I'd also stated he was insane. This was a notion shared by some others, including a special officer in the Auxiliary Police Force, which was little more than a private security force that operated under the actual police force. This officer arrested Norton in 1867 and tried to have him committed to an asylum. This outraged Norton's loyal subjects, who pointed out that he was a harmless eccentric who had committed no crime. The police chief ordered the release of Norton and issued an apology. Norton responded by granting an imperial pardon to the special officer that arrested him. From then on, the police saluted Emperor Norton as he passed in the street. He had captured the hearts of the people, but his empire was largely powerless without official recognition. To this end, Norton attempted to establish diplomatic relations with various foreign leaders. These attempts often went ignored, such as his proposals to marry Queen Victoria, but hilariously, the King of Hawaii refused to recognise the US government near the end of his reign, instead acknowledging Emperor Norton as the sole leader of the United States. As his fame grew, so too did rumours surrounding his legend. Some claimed Norton was the son of French Emperor Napoleon III, some claimed he was massively wealthy. It's thought a lot of the rumours surrounding Norton's life came from newspapers inventing decrees and publishing them under his name. On January 8th, 1880, Emperor Joshua Norton collapsed in the street while on his way to a lecture at the California Academy of Sciences and died at the age of 61. His reign lasted 20 years. After his death, it was found the rumours of Norton's secret wealth were erroneous. In a search of his room at the boarding house, it was found his possessions amounted to a few dollars, his uniforms, a battered sabre, and some imperial documents, hilariously including forged responses to his diplomatic efforts. Norton was to receive a pauper's funeral, however, when local businesses learned of this, they contributed funds to ensure he had a nicely constructed casket and a dignified funeral. Reportedly, over 10,000 people showed up to pay their respects, from the wealthiest businessman to the poorest labourer. Today there are efforts to rename the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge to the Emperor Norton Bridge, meaning he is still a somewhat relevant figure in San Francisco's politics, well over a hundred years after his death. So I guess if you wanted to declare yourself a ruler, Emperor Norton's example is probably a good one to follow. Of course you'll still have to pay taxes and obey the law, but that's your problem, not mine. As the High King of Ireland, I am of course above such matters. As always, my subjects are commanded to like and subscribe, and I'm sure you've heard this one before, kiss my royal Irish ass. Mm -hmm.